Hi, I'm Mark Maya, writer and creator of So Called Living. You can find me at Board Game Coffee on YouTube and Instagram, and you can check out So Called Living on Kickstarter. And right now, you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. I'm Casey Kaysen. <laughs> Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a very talented creator. He is a first-time comic creator, has a very popular YouTube channel. We were joined by fellow Canadian, Mark Maya. How are you doing today? I'm great. Thanks for having me on. This is very exciting. It's funny how many Canadians you bump into, you know, yeah. <laughs> looking into this because I was like, oh yeah, he's Canadian. He's Canadian. He's Canadian. That's, that's great. So yeah. Go. We bump into each other at Tim Hortons all the yeah. time. Yeah, exactly. The one, the one Tim Hortons. Yeah. There's not many. We just all go to the same one. You got to feed the addiction. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and then we'll just go to McDonald's for the actual taste of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> that's some canadian uh, heritage for anyone that decides to watch or listen to this episode for those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person tell us who you are and what you're bringing to two geeks talking today well my name is mark maya i uh first time comic book creator i'm putting out a comic book entitled so-called living it's launching on kickstarter march 26th and uh, it's definitely a passion project. And I also have a YouTube channel that's focused on board games, which is Board Game Coffee. Actually, this is one of my sweaters, which I've worn two days in a row, actually. Uh, <laughs> it, says, it says Sleep Less, Play More. And it's got our logo right there. Uh, but yeah, if you, so if you go to YouTube and you search for Board Game Coffee, you'll see our channel. It's full of how to plays and playthroughs and unboxings and reviews, previews, all that good stuff all board game related well tell us what so-called living is about because being a first-time comic creator that's got to be a little exciting and a little terrifying it is very terrifying terrifying is a good word every day i think i got it down i'm like okay i'm calm i am calm then the next day i just freak out i just freak out again it, it's nerve-wracking like just to let you know i i wrote this script like 15 or 16 years ago uh for so-called living i was trying to get it off the ground with like various artists and my original plan was to, you know, like just work as a partnership with this artist, but that didn't work out. So I'm kind of making a long story short. Eventually I stopped working on it and then fast forward to uh, 2023 and I decided, you know what, I'm going to do this, but I'm just going to find an artist, pay them outright. There's no partnerships. I own everything, you know, just kind of keep it nice and clean. Like you get paid guaranteed. Cause the problem with the partnership is if you actually do a partnership, if the comic book doesn't make any money, then you don't make any money. And I get people not wanting to put that time in for somebody else's passion project and the promise of no money. I get it. I get it. But I did offer a good deal, which we can get into later. So all I did now this time was just like, all right, here's the deal. I'm going to pay you upfront. You're going to pay for these books. And if I make money or not, it doesn't matter. You got paid for the books. Right. But if like if it if it makes more than anticipated, then you're not getting half. Like I've already paid you. It's like a you know work for hire type of situation. But if it does extremely well, I I'd love to give my artist a bonus. Like I'd love to be in the position to bring in enough funding to the project where I could give my artist a bonus. That'd be great. I like taking care of my artists, and I, I say that because even though this is my first comic book, I've been in the video game industry for twenty four years. Most of that time I've been a creative director slash art director. So I had a lot of artists working for me, I hired a lot of artists and I did a lot of art reviews and I always tried to take care of them as much as I could. I wanted artists to be always treated fairly. But yeah. So what is so-called living all about? Uh, so-called living is about a guy named Jack. Jack is your average average guy, but he's living in a world that's very much not average. He exists in a world where vampires, werewolves, zombies, etc., ghosts, it's all they're all commonplace entities. They're just there. And they're not hiding in the shadows. Like you could have a, a werewolf barista or a vampire cab driver that only works at night. Those characters don't exist. I just made them up. But it's possible in this world. Jack gets turned into a vampire. The story starts off with him adapting to this new life as a vampire, like learning to follow vampire rules. Mm -hmm. So he's into his old habits because he's been a human his whole life until right now. So he's got to deal with things like, oh, there's a no vampire clause invite thing at, in his apartment, so he can't get in. 
So he's homeless. He walks into the sun first thing in the morning and he catches on fire. So he's got to, got to adapt to like, I can't go out in the day anymore. So it's a bit, it starts off goofy, but then it gets more serious as it goes. It's a dark comedy. And eventually Jack gets in way over his head and he's got to deal with it with the help of his friends. So what is it about the vampire and cryptid genres that people who don't follow them misunderstand? It's a, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, the most I can think of is vampires aren't all, all those creatures. They're not as limited to the two dimension, two dimensional ideas that people have in their mind of them. You know what I mean? People think vampires, they think uh, Bram Stokers, they think uh, zombies, they think, they're stuck on like the, um, the traditional slow shambling guys. Everybody's got to be afraid. It's the end of the world. If this happens in so-called living, we've changed all those rules. You'll, you'll still recognize them as a vampire, but in a society where they're commonplace, the rules have changed. But it also gives a, a fresh take on the sometimes tired tropes of these types of genres that, like you said, Bram Stoker's or George A. Romero or whoever else is, is out there, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. You know, there, there's a bunch of different types of staples in sci-fi horror genre that we're all used to. But I love twists like this because it gives you a little more flexibility. Right away, page one of book one, which actually, actually book one is free. You can read it on Comixology. Page one, you'll notice right away that the world is different. So then let's talk about the team. Obviously you are the writer and creator of this particular series, but who was the artist you finally chose to make this world a reality? Marco Leone. Uh, Marco Leone is an artist in Italy. Italian is his first language. He's working on his English. He's, uh, he's getting better as I've been working with him. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, there are some like language barrier issues that we deal with. I speak zero Italian. He speaks way better English than I do Italian. <laughs> so he's doing good at like, you know, figuring out my scripts and writing them out. But every once in a while, there's some nuances in the English language and North American way of speaking that is uh, misinterpreted or, or lost on him. I get it because his whole life is, I was born in Italy. I live in Italy. I don't talk the way you North Americans do, right? Sometimes he'll he'll draw a panel back. He does roughs and I comment on his roughs and I'll scribble over his roughs. And sometimes I'll send them reference images of like Sokka from Avatar, like for the cartoon. And I'll be like, no, I need Jack to have like a facial expression like this, <laughs> or I need people to be interacting like this <laughs> because uh, he just misinterpreted it. Where like he interpreted it as him being angry. He was like, no, he's not angry. He's frightened. They just explain it like that. But Marco is, is fantastic. He's exactly what i was looking for you had a kind of like an animation mindset for this particular comic series because well based off Sokka and based off of probably other things that you're hinting at as well i think that's that's really cool to see yeah i like the that over exaggerated of like that over exaggerated comic book style of like humberto R ramos he's got you know the big hands and he's very his faces are very animated so I was looking for that. And the way I did so-called living was I had a, an idea in my head that this is what the artwork is going to look like for so-called living. It's the style that matched my story. I wrote the story first and I was like, what style best tells this story, right? I figured out, oh, it's like Ramos. So I need to find somebody that draws like Ramos. So somewhere close, you know, this is a bit of wiggle room. And when I put out a call to like Twitter, it's like, I need artists. I got back. 98% people I drew in the teenage romance anime style, mm -hmm. like that manga style, you know, the pointy chin, the very pretty people, <laughs> but that style works for manga and that works for a lot of stories, but it does not work for so-called living. It's not the vibe, right? I've, I'm a very strong believer in the art. The art is what lures you in yeah. and it should give you a taste of what you're going to get. So Marco's artwork is kind of light and funny. It's got this sarcastic flavor to it. And when you read the, the book, it matches. So it's like if I was doing a dark, gritty story, I wouldn't use Marco's art. I'd get somebody who draws a little more seriously. He's a little heavier on the blacks and maybe a little scratchier artwork. So I like to find an artist that fits the story. Once you finally found your artist, once you started getting this planned out and you got the, the roughs and all that stuff, what was a piece of artwork you got back from your talented artist that just was way better than what you had on the page? Uh, the, it would be the, the character lineup. Before we got started, here's a description of what, how I see these characters. 
and I give him lots of references. I was like, this character is kind of like this character. This character is kind of like this. He's tall. He's fat. She's short. He's tall. You know, like I gave him all these descriptions, patchworks of people like, like Frankenstein. I'm just handing him body parts. Here's the hair. Here's the face. Here's the body. Here's the, right. And then here's the personality. And then he came back with a character lineup that I was like, nailed it. So <laughs> that, that was it. So it started right from his his character lineup. That's awesome. I, I love it. Being a first time creator that you are, the fact that you, you're dusting off a script after 15 years, did you have to go back and fine tune it, edit it? Was there some terminology or wording that you used maybe back then that didn't quite fit in today's world? Yeah, there were there was the odd one, but very little. Like I didn't change much of the script. I think I changed some reference to mobile devices. Okay. There's more of a, an iPhone situation now <laughs> that I, I don't remember when the iPhone came out a while ago, but I updated technology a bit in the book. So it matched a little bit more. But as far as wording goes, like I think I mentioned Twitter and there's a mention of Twitter in book two. And I was just like, I thought, I was going to be more into Twitter, but I wasn't, but I was like, I left it in there. <laughs> but there's, I can't remember exactly references, but there are certain things that I did update. It didn't make sense anymore. Like I'm talking about like MySpace or, <laughs> or something. And I was like, let's, let's just take that out. <laughs> you could have just said social media platforms and it probably would have covered everything for the next, you know, 20 years until VR comes into play. Until the internet just dies because of apocalypse, you know? <laughs> You know, looking at this particular campaign here, I don't know if you've ever done a Kickstarter campaign for, say, board game coffee, have you? I've never done a run a Kickstarter before. I've done videos for other people's Kickstarters. So like, you know, I've done a review or preview video so somebody can put on their page. But other than making a video, which I know how to do, I've never had to interact behind the scenes with a Kickstarter page. So I was a total noob going into all of this. Like I didn't know how to write a script. I didn't know how to find an artist. I didn't know how to do a Kickstarter page. I didn't know really how Kickstarter worked from behind the scenes. Like I knew so little <laughs> going into this. So I can very much give noobs like the uh, crash course and like, this is what I did wrong. And this is what I did right. And it's fresh. I'm doing it. I'm currently doing it. So how's that going for you, by the way? <laughs> Oh, the Kickstarter is going fantastic. Beautiful. That's the good response to have. <laughs> <laughs> That's the wonderful thing about a Kickstarter because like your YouTube channel and like, you know, your family life, it's like a third job now. Constantly promoted to the point of getting a cease and desist letter and then, you know, have fun with the lawyers and, and away you go. But at least you got the campaign out there. That's my goal is to make people sick of so-called living. So they're just talking about it and they're very, you know, the water coolers, they're just like, have you seen the annoying guy talking about so-called living. <laughs> and then somebody's going to hear, no, I haven't heard about it. You know what? I'm going to check out his Kickstarter. <laughs> it's like, you know, there's no, no, no bad press, no such thing as bad press. We'll yeah. see. <laughs> we'll see. That blood. That's good. Talk about some of the characters that you've created here. You touched on the main character as well, but who are, who are some of the other supporting characters or main characters that are surrounding, uh, surrounding Jack? In book one, there's Jack, his girlfriend, Jill, which is um, a joke we play on later. So you know about Jack. Jill, have you ever watched the show Third Rock from the Sun? Oh, yeah. Okay, the youngest kid. He had a girlfriend. I think her name was Autumn. And she was very, like, very tough to the point. She didn't take no shit. And he was basically the weak-willed one compared to her, like, strong personality. That's Jill. <laughs> so Jill was based on her. I actually sent Marco a picture of Autumn. I, again, I think that's her name. I sent him a bit. I was like, this is Jill. And her personality is pretty much this person. And uh, next we want move, move on to Nick and Nick. Remember I wrote these characters 15, 16 years ago. Nick is basically Lobo, like his, his look and his personality is Lobo, but his personality is also bring it up to present day, a uh, reference butcher from the boys. Nice. Okay. So he's very much butcher from the boys. And when I first watched the boys, cause I actually never read the comic, but when I first watched the show, I looked over at my wife and I said, butcher's Nick. <laughs> Like that's from now on, if anybody asks, Nick is Butcher because <laughs> more people know Butcher than Lobo because of like this TV show. His buddy, his other vampire is Casper and Nick is big. He's Lobo big. And then Casper is even bigger, but he's got a little more chunk on him and he's like quiet. He's like the loyal sidekick, you know, intimidating, but might be a big softy, but you'd be hard pressed to find out because he's a scary looking dude. <laughs> so and he wears a big red hoodie like this. Yeah, and then in book two, you meet uh, Tim and Marvin, who are Jack's friends. And you also meet uh, some other characters. I don't want to spoil 
<laughs> but you'll meet some other characters. But yeah, Tim and uh, Marvin are that ensemble of Jack, Tim, Marv is kind of like the ensemble cast and you'd find in a comedy of like friends or like mm-hmm. how I met your mother. You know what I mean? So they're a bunch of like Jack is the in charge guy of that group but only because they're a mess too, <laughs> you know? So he comes, he's like the main guy that kind of holds it all together. They're all a bit of goofballs, no matter how serious they try to be, but then they get, they come across some very serious people. You kind of imagine like the cast of friends uh, having to deal with the Sopranos. <laughs> so I'd watch that series. That's uh, that's kind of it. Actually the humor somebody brought up uh, the other day. If you like cabin in the woods, you're probably going to like so-called living. So it doesn't it doesn't have that level of gore, at least not yet. <laughs> it's 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 a build up because the series is planned to be eight books. Oh wow! So that's four Kickstarters. Each Kickstarter has two books. If this is successful, then I can do three and four, and then so on. If that's successful, five, six, and then seven, eight. I think that's wonderful. The fact that you're getting two books out of one campaign is is really great to see because that definitely provides value for for those that are supporting this campaign. And you have the story all written out. The only thing I have to do is I have to tighten up the last script. That's pretty much it. Everything's done. My scripts are written in a fashion that I understand. Marco, I'm working with somebody in Italy who English is not their first language. They'd look at the script and they'd be like, are you crazy? Like, what is this? is just like scribbles of a madman. Like, what's happening here? I was like, it makes sense to me, Marco. <laughs> so... Anyways, I got to clean that up. I'm actually sending um, sending him the script for book four for him to look at and, you know, start thinking concepts because he's read the script for book three. So that was in a format. So he, he's got some ideas, got some character concepts, but now I'm going to send him the script for book four in a format that I'd send it to you and you could read it because, you know, you know how to read English, but you'd still be like, what, what your pages are labeled one to 80. It's like, how does, how does that work? It's just a stream of consciousness. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's not broken up properly into pages and panels. It will be. It's, I just have to format it properly. By the time you're done with your artist there, he's going to be very fluent in Maya ease. Yeah, he is. <laughs> he's he's going to try to read something else and be like, what is this? This isn't the English I know. I was dealing with a crazy Canadian with a stream of consciousness. You know, I, I'd rather deal with Italian than freaking. I have a better understanding of reading hieroglyphs, deciphering hieroglyphs on the pyramids. Although for some reason I have a hankering for Canadian coffee. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> because you're in multiple industries, because you're in the video game industry with YouTube in terms of board games, and now you're also a comic creator, everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most bullshit piece of advice you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in your various careers? <laughs> All right, let's see. The uh, s- second wisest bit of information I've uh, received is... Competition is a good thing. It makes you better. That's the best thing. If you and that kind of works for everything, anything in the in a creative field. If you look at what other people are doing, just keep trying to outdo them. It's it's like your own internal little competition, right? And I I think that's the gamer in me responding to that, right? Because I'm a competitive person, so I'm always going to try to outdo other people. The number one piece of advice is I'm always trying to outdo myself as well. I'm never happy with what I do. And if it is, it's fleeting. And then you look back and you're like, that was shit. <laughs> so, let's do it again. So when are you happy? Uh, it's a good question. I'm very hard on myself. I'm happy when I make other people happy. So if I can put out a story that other people enjoy, if I put out a video game that other people enjoy, or a how to play video that helps other people, that's when I'm happy. I'm happy when other people are happy. But working in a vacuum, just writing a script that like people haven't read yet, or ha- putting out a comic book, or working on a video that people haven't seen yet, it's I'm in my own head, man. I'm just just hating on myself. <laughs> so uh, no matter what I do, I'm the I'm my own harshest critic hands down for everything I do. But that's the the nature of the beast, unfortunately, being a creative person. You have to deal with these types of struggles and these types of situations. You don't know what's going to register well with people that watch it. I mean, I've had some videos, short videos more recently, where it's just been constantly shit on by people hitting the downvote button, yet the content is nothing different than anything else I've promoted. You do what you can because you love it, but give me a break sometimes. <laughs> I get that. I've started in my recent unboxings because I had a, some big projects 
on the board game coffee side, it kept me tied up for a long time. So I didn't put out videos for a while because there were just these huge projects. And then I ran into Christmas and then I was on vacation and then I, I then I was burnt out. So I was just like, I'm just going to step back for a bit. So I started doing unboxings again, because something easy to get back into it and get these things out of their boxes so I can put them on the shelf properly. But I started mentioning the video. It's like, one of the things I get criticized on a lot is like, I'll open up a game that I know nothing about. It might be like, maybe it's a Harry Potter game. Maybe it's a game based on Dune or whatever it is. And I'll forget a fact because like, yeah, I've read all the Harry Potter books. I've read all the movies or sorry, watched all the movies, but I've got a terrible memory. I've got a terrible memory. So like, I can't re- remember, um, you know, like Harry, Hermione, like I might forget their names. <laughs> of like the most basic things and people just uh zero percent chance you've ever read a harry potter book i was like no i've read all the books i've just got i've read and i read and you know what i read i've read all the harry potter books but they're not even in my top 10 of books i like to read like i like them just fine i enjoyed the movies because i like big budget movies but i'm not a diehard i'll tell you right now i'm not a diehard harry potter fan but i enjoy the license i bought the uh the card games for it which i think are great there's a deck building game for it, which is amazing. But yeah, yeah, people call me out on like because I forget the details. And they're like, you know, instantly it's like, you don't know anything. Or one time somebody was like, uh, and I put it out another video in response to that. Uh, somebody was like, you can tell this guy is just a new comic book fan based on the movies. Like, that's all he does. He just got in the movies and all of a sudden he's a fan. I was like, first two, th- I got so much to say about that. <laughs> First of all, there's no criteria to being a fan. Even if I just watched a mo- my first movie, superhero movie yesterday, and all of a sudden I'm like, I'm a Batman fan, then you're a Batman fan. You don't have to have 20 years experience reading comic books and like knowing every last detail about like Thomas and Martha, Wayne, like whatever. You don't need to know all those details. <laughs> I've been reading comic books since I was 13. I've got like 42 or 46 bins filled with comics, <laughs> which I stopped at some point or I'd have more. And I got a bunch of digital comics. Mm-hmm. Like I'm 100% the comic, <laughs> comic book fanboy. And yeah, and then people just come out and they don't, if you don't have anything nice to say. So that's what I've been, this is what I was trying to get to. In my videos, I've started saying, if you don't have anything nice to say, just don't say, just carry on. I know I'm going to say things wrong. I know you might not like this, but that's okay. Just watch another video. Just do something else. It's okay not to like it. You don't have to come in here and just like shit on my parade. You don't, you just don't have to. You don't have to. You can logo live your life. Be happy. Look for things that make you happy. Don't sh- sit here on my video and just be angry. Why are you watching it if you're so angry? Anyways, that was my rant. No, 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 it's it's a good, it's a very good rant. Hundred percent truth, you know. No, no, I think it's perfect. You're not doing hot takes. You're just doing things that you found, you enjoy, and that you want to share with the people that support your channel. And we're only here for a short amount of time. Live your life, enjoy it. Thing is, like, I do try to be careful because I'm in so many different industries that I don't even if I had to comment to, I'm a little, I'm a little uh, wary sometimes to even stand up for people because like. I, I don't know if I can deal with the backlash right now. You know what I mean? Like yeah. if it goes wrong today, I'm not going to mention specifics, but today somebody said something that my wife was not very happy with online. It was some stupid comment about them being judgmental about art on something. And she was like, this is so stupid. And this person is speaking for all women. She's like, I'm a woman. I have no issues with this, but I don't want to say it because I'm going to get into an argument with this person. And they're going to be like, oh, you're board game coffees <laughs> wife. <laughs> We're going to boycott your project. <laughs> so, so, oh yeah, just lay off for a little bit. Just, just a little bit. I don't mind drama, but not now, not now. <laughs> I'm, I'm nervous already. It, and it, it happens. It happens in all the, like, I've, I've been witness to uh, people who are like living the high life and then they do something dumb and all of a sudden they're toxic as in like, oh, I can't even be seen with you. <laughs> It's dangerous to be seen with you. Like I'm pretty good because I don't like, I, I go with it, but I get why people stay away from them. And unless you're like behind some sort of book burning <laughs> something, or I'm pretty much still okay with you being like, that's, you know, everybody has their own opinions and, or you made a mistake and that's fine. I know you as a person and we'll be okay. But yeah, if you go too far, there, there is a limit to yeah, too yeah. far. And then you start dragging people down that want to support you. Seeing as you're breaching into a new industry here with, with comics, what are some challenges that comic creators face that needs to be addressed? Coming from a perspective of a writer, uh, one of the challenges I came across was, this is a two-parter for me, was finding an artist, right? And then that led that leads to, if you read the comments, there's a lot of people online, and there's, sh- there's shady people on both ends of this, um, both sides of this, I mean. 
as in you find an artist. So do you pay the artist first and then he draws your pages? Does he draw your pages and then you pay the artist? Do you do half and half? At some point, somebody is holding money and the other person is holding work. But like, it's like we need a middleman system. It's like, here, you hold the money. When they deliver, you give it to them. They don't start until they know the middleman has the money. That would be the safest bet, <laughs> right? And, uh, but as there's so many conversations online about people like, ripping other people off. So I think one of the challenges, especially as a, a new person coming online, you know, or like wanting to break into the industry as an artist or a writer is trying to find people you can work with that you can trust that aren't going to rob you. And it's hard to do online because you don't know who these people are. You have no idea who they are for real. And I got lucky with Marco because uh, Marco does the project first. He illustrates all the pages and then I pay him, but I would never not pay him, but that's my personality I would never let somebody hang out to dry. I'm a man of my word. If I tell you, I will pay you. I will pay you if I have to go into debt to pay you. Like it's going to happen because I said I would do it, right? And I, if I ever can't do something for some reason, and it would never be not pay somebody. But if, like, I if, if I even told you, yeah, I'll be there Friday, and I forgot, I, I'll be hating myself for days. Like it irritates me. But not everybody has that same stand up thing. And Marco was like that too. He was like, okay, I. I trust you. I'm going to do your work. I know you're going to pay me. And so it's finding somebody you trust. And if you got friends that you know face to face that you can work with, like all power to you. Like that seems like the way to go, but that's hard to do. A lot of us have to go online and find people. And you hear a lot of artists being like, oh, take money up front. What if I've heard stories of artists taking money up front and not drawing anything or drawing half and then taking off or not delivering at the quality that they said they could deliver at? Like there's so many things, there's so many things that can go wrong on both sides and it's risky. Your best bet is like, kind of like renting your place on Airbnb. You got to find somebody that's got a good review. You know what I mean? You got to two people that have a good track record and get them together and be like, okay, I trust you're going to pay me. I trust you're going to do my work. So I'd say that's, that's the hurdle. <laughs> Between your YouTube channel and being in the video game industry, especially in Canada, specifically because the video game industry is usually is a North American market, but there's other studios elsewhere in the world here. What is it about the video game industry that is exciting to still be in, in this day and age after you've been in it for so long? As an adopter as for, of early technology. <laughs> so whenever new tech comes out, like I want to gamify it. So when people think of the video game industry, a lot of people just think, oh, like PlayStation, Xbox, you know, but there is a section of the video game industry that has to do the like, gamification of everyday, like your Apple, what are they called? The Apple i Pro thing. I ever forgot what they were called. I'm drawing a blank right now, <laughs> but like those big expensive goggles with the AR, AR goggles. I want a pair because I like new tech. I want to play with it and I want to create something for it. I want to make something fun for it. I want to gamify something for it. So there's always new tech. And when new tech comes into the industry, the video game studios will try to make something out of it, right? Like the iPhone came up. So then all of a sudden mobile gaming became a thing. Yeah, there was mobile gaming before because I, I actually created some games for like the like Sony Ericsson's and stuff like that, like before, way before iPhones even existed. But then when iPhones came out, it just blew up. And I remember when I saw the first, before they were released and I saw the first like keynote mm -hmm. and I was like, yes, let's do something for this. And you know, the DS came out with two screens and you're like, yeah, let's do something for that. I like the evolution of the video game industry and it doesn't say stale for too long. And if you are in a studio that is stale, then there's probably opportunities for you somewhere else. You, you have to make that call for yourself because some studios, if they get successful, if they make one successful thing, good chance they're going to stay doing that one successful thing. It makes no sense for them to take risks doing something else. It's like this one successful thing is keeping like hundreds or thousands of people employed for like years, you know, because it's Call of Duty. So that studio is going to do Call of Duty forever. Right. They might do a passion project on the side here and there, but there'll be like, I don't know if Call of Duty is necessarily the best example because I don't know what else that team is doing, but you get the idea. If, if you got something successful, chances are you're not going to pull away from it. But there's so many opportunities in the video game industry to do new things. And I love new tech. So I guess that's what keeps me interested. Like I'm working on an AR project right now that I can't talk about because of NDAs. So I'm not going to lead you into that same... <laughs> That same hole that you mentioned earlier. <laughs> it's fun to just work with new tech. The people with VR goggles and that they just get so immersed in that world that they just lose all balance and sense of, you know, 
self. My VR space is actually in front of these seats. I have that. You see that little rug? It's like a little Persian rug thing mm. right there. There you go. Right there. <laughs> that's that's where my uh, I have my VR tracking cameras here. I haven't played with it in a while, but that's just because work's been busy, so I haven't had a chance. I've had so many people in here and them running into walls, and you look at them, and you're like, okay, you're okay, you're okay, you're okay. Turn over to get a drink, and all you hear is boom. It's like I took my eyes off of you for a second, and you're over there punching my power box. Stop! Like you see that where that white box is right there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, like so many people have hit those cables. <laughs> it's like I left you in the center of the room. This is gearing up for being a better parent in the future, which you currently are right now. So it's just gearing you up toward that level of, okay, my kid is now in a VR state. He's going to run into things. I got to protect him. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, it's, it's going to change. It's going to change parenting forever. <laughs> you know what I want to do with my kids? A quick side note is uh, when he's old enough to actually go on online, I want him to go through my old comments and like all the nasty comments. And I want to show them how like these guys are just that don't matter. Ignore them because there's a lot of kids out there feeling a lot of pressure from just negative comments from people who would never, they're too cowardly to say it to your face. Don't give any weight to the online who are just commenting just to bring you down, to bring themselves up. Don't even worry about them. You're already better than they are. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? It's a good one. <laughs> Um, hmm, that's tough. I think that that's uh, that's that's a deeper question than I am a deep person. Um, for, for some reason, I'm stuck on this example of uh, it's not language having power; it's it's the opposite of how um, the wrong type of language can just just kill a whole mood. <laughs> I, I had to go talk to a school young kids. It was something I did a lot of about getting into the video game industry they're like send us a bio and i was like i hate writing for myself gave it to somebody else i was like could you write me a bio and they're like yeah sure i'll do it write you a bio i never read the bio <laughs> and i get there and they got the bio and everybody else that went before me their bio was like two lines and it was like straight to the point i was like i get it i'm engaged my bio went on for like a page and a half and it was so it sounds like it was from, written from me. Like I wrote it. So it was writing from a first person perspective and I never wrote it. And it was like in my greatness, I had, like, it was so like self-gratifying and I was like, Oh my God, like shoot me now. So I, uh, I was like, you, you can just, you can just stop, stop reading. Just, you don't have to read anymore. I'll sum it up from here. I didn't write that. Uh, just give me a heads up. Um, so I guess that is kind of an example of like the way you write about yourself can dictate how people see you and somebody else wrote something for me and it changed everybody's like from then on, I was like bombing. I was, I usually do well, but after that bio, I was bombing hard. No matter what I said, I couldn't, they had that idea in their head that I was just like, Oh, I'm so awesome listen to me and then it buried me so i guess that is that is an example of writing having power of swaying people in one way and it's it's hard to get them the other way and even how you write emails to people like i'm not a very good emailer necessarily i try to keep my emails short uh, i have a hard time with it because talking face to face i have no problem talking with people face to face but my e emails come off as curt the, to the point i sound like a bit of an asshole I do, but I'm not trying to be at all, but that's just how I write. It's very straightforward, straight to the point, no fluff. Where my wife, she most of her job is emails. She's the master of fluff and wording things, you know, soft intros into the next line. I'm just like, I'll be there. This is what I'm going to do. This is, gonna, this is how we're going to take care of it. See there, boom, done. And people are like, wow, you're a bit of a dick. <laughs> so, so yeah, not so, not so much as uh, like the stories, aspect of it but uh just your everyday writings and your communications and those words that you see from people is my best example that i can come up with for words having power but in the sea of ai and chat gpt and things like that which it really sounds like your friend just threw it into a here here's the guy's name here's what he does just give me a quick bio about him and then chat gpt spit out three pages it was before chat gpt existed okay so he definitely wrote it he thought he was doing a good job he thought he was doing me a favor and it might look good to him reading it, but uh, having a student reading out to you and 
I remember she got up and she, like each student read a bio for somebody else and she, she held it up in front of her and they're older. They're like, these were like grade six students. She's reading. She's like, Oh my God, I got to read this thing. And then all the other students are like, Oh, they're just bored out of their mind. And I was like, stop, please, please stop. Please. And they all looked at me. Like the teachers are looking at me. I was like, don't, she's fine. You did fine. You can just sit down. You can just sit. It's not you. It's me. Just, you can just sit. <laughs> What are three things that you've accomplished that you're proud of? First thing that pops to mind is back in the day before iPhone, uh, one of the first mobile games I did was uh, 24 based on the show. Mm -hmm. We just started a new studio. It was a studio that I co-founded and we're brand new. I'm not even sure we were a year old yet. We got the opportunity to work on this huge license, which was 24. And I love 24. I love that show. I'm a Jack Bauer fan. <laughs> I, I was watching it all the time and this license comes in, our CEO just came up to me. He's the guy I started the, the company with. We have a chance to do the 24 uh, mobile game. We need you to fly to, uh, I think it was LA is where I went. And we had to talk to Fox Studios and talk to the people there to convince them for us to do it. I was like, what? And he's like, yeah, you'll, um, we're going to put you, there's a producer that he's American. You'll talk to him. He'll, he'll set you straight. Basically what happened, short, long story short, developer studio that makes video games got with a publisher you know, pays people to make video games. They, they have the licenses. So they have the license for 24. They got this developer to make it. And this developer promised things back in the day for like a razor, like, like a razor type of phone that wasn't possible even on the Xbox at the time. <laughs> so they promised that and they couldn't deliver. So now publishers screwed because they're like, we have to tell Fox that we dropped the ball on this. We, now we got to get another studio. We got to convince them, trust us this time. This studio is going to be able to do it. So flew down to LA. I sat down with some like exec execs at Fox and they're like, why should we let you do this? Why should we give you this license? Like this, this Joker's already like screwed over by hiring this other studio that couldn't do it. What makes you think you can do it? So I told them all our experience later on the table. And they're like, all right, it's yours. So it was like, excellent. So we did it. And we had to do it in like four months, something crazy. I did the game design, the art, and the writing because uh, we were a small studio. At the beginning, it was just me and pro another programmer. And then we got another programmer to come in and help out later. So there was three of us on the team. The game won a BAFTA. And for those of you who don't know, that's a big award in the UK. Because <laughs> we went on to do a sequel. And uh, both the first one and the second one on IGN, I can't remember which one got which score, but one got a nine, the other one got a 9.2. And the comments were like, this is how you do a a mobile game based on an IP. I did all the writing, just so you know. I only had to talk to the writers about like, I might have a character and they're like, oh, you can't use that character. They're going to die next season. And I, as a fan, I was like, I don't want to know that. I don't want to know that. <laughs> so, but anyways, but I wrote everything and uh, there was an article that came out and they gave all the credit to the story to the guys at Fox. You're like, oh, you can tell it was written by the scries over at Fox Studios. I was like, oh, well, that's a compliment, but I didn't get any credit for it. So thanks. So that, that was a compliment. You know, working on a team that did the BAFTA, the team did a great job last minute. So that was excellent. That was one. Uh, the other uh, good accomplishment would be shorter. We did Secret Agent Barbie for the Game Boy Color. Now that was, or Game Boy Advance, sorry, Game Boy Advance. That was a game. Uh, our head designer came in and they were like, we're doing Secret Agent Barbie. And the team was like, uh, <laughs> don't we want to do Secret Agent Barbie? But I was like, I'll do it. I'm in, I'm in. I, I because they were, uh, they basically like, you can design it. So this is the first game that I got to design from like scratch. So I designed it. The only thing I didn't design was the boss fights. The lead designer did it. He just designed the boss fights. Everything else was just, was me. I designed it. He put it together in a doc. Mind you, he got all the credit for it, but I designed it. The entire team, put the entire team on the stand. They'll tell you who designed it. <laughs> but that game got reviewed really well. Uh, the guys from God of War, the yeah. God of War, they actually were in an interview saying, we took um, inspiration from weird games. Like we played Secret Agent Barbie for the Game Boy Advance. No, really, it's a good game. That was in their interview. I was like, that's awesome. <laughs> and we got credited as, this is funny, we got credited as the best Metal Gear Solid knockoff on the GBA. And on top of that, when Metal Gear Solid finally did come out on the GBA, they knocked us off. So they took inspiration for because we were working with EA at the time or uh, with producers from there. So and the same producer that was working on our like was working in the studio. I don't he wasn't working necessarily with Secret Agent Barbie, but he saw the project. I think can't remember if he was involved in it because we had a whole bunch of projects going on at once. He later worked with. Uh, or was involved somehow with the Metal Gear Solid guys. So I'm pretty sure he was like, oh, look at this, get ideas from this. And they did so many things that we did for Secret Agent Barbie in Metal Gear Solid. <laughs> Those, and just for the record, we never used Metal Gear Solid as a reference point. 
So <laughs> that was accomplishment number two that I was very proud of. The third one was, I guess, getting into the video game industry. And actually, no, 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 no. Writing this book and finding Marco Leone is the third one. That's a great accomplishment. Like the fact that like, other than the, the print and it being in your hands, this comic book is done. It's good to go. Do you know what I mean? Like, and that's something I've wanted to do ever since I was a kid. I've always wanted to write my own comic book ever since I started reading comics when I was 13. And just to give you a scale, like I'm 47. <laughs> so I, it's, that was, a, that was a long time coming and finally doing it is amazing. And uh, having the support of my wife is amazing. She's backing me the whole time. Uh, if it wasn't for her, um, it would have never happened. It would have never happened. She did. She's amazing. So there's actually in the first page, if you flip the cover of the book one, there's like a white page with a bunny on it. And there's a whole little section just dedicated to her. Like without her, this wouldn't have ever happened. So yeah, this is my page. It's not live. So again, forgive some of the information if it's wrong. I think most of it's right, but I always catch something that's wrong. And we did get recently, as I mentioned earlier, we did get uh, the projects we love at Kickstarter badge, which is great. Well, technically that art you had on yourself, but there is an official heart if you search for it. And we're in the projects we love category, which is very exciting, very exciting. And for my first project, I was just stoked. So yeah, as you move down, you'll see that some of the tiers we have, we have a digital only tier. Keep in, keep in mind all these prices you're seeing are Canadian. From our research, the typical book on Kickstarter is like $10 to $15 a comic book. So we went down the middle at $12.50. And again, that's Canadian. So I think American, that's like $8 and something. Uh, sounds like a pretty good deal to me. <laughs> so, yeah. so you can get the, the digi just the digital only. And every time you get a physical tier, you also get the digital version of that tier. So if you get the standard covers, which is what you're looking at now, uh, you'll get the digital version with those standard covers. And as you can see, we also included the first five pages of the book on our page. So you can get a, a little taste of how the story is. By the time you get to the bottom of those five pages, you'll see that you can actually, there's a link to the entire first book. The second tier we have that you're at now is our um, so-called living elite covers mm -hmm. or the elite edition. And that's uh, guest artists that we have come on to do covers. You'll actually see it as you scroll down, you'll see bigger images of them. So that's, uh, and then as you scroll, you'll see those are the standard editions. If you keep scrolling, you'll see more and the digital standard covers. And now here's the elite. So the purple cover um, of Jack running toward the, toward the reader, that's, that's done by Derek Lofman, who's got a huge following on Instagram. He's worked for Marvel. He's a, he's an old friend and amazing artist. Uh, so he did that cover for me as a guest, as a guest artist. And the other cover, which is actually a picture of Toronto, it's a photograph of Toronto, done by a amazing photographer from Toronto called Ashton Techno Prasad. He's got an Instagram channel. He's super talented. He takes a lot of risks to get these photos. He like climbs on buildings on like scaffolding. He takes some huge risks to get these high up shots. And uh, I've known him since I think he was like 10 years old. <laughs> so he was, uh, he let us use some of his art for a cover, which I thought was great. So that's the uh, elite edition. You can back, you can upgrade to that. And, and as you can see, when you're backing, you're getting books one and two. So these standard covers are from Marco Leone. This is the same guy who did the inside pages. So that's your standard covers. I, I love these. These are incredible. And, and if you notice, there's a little bit of a bunny motif. Yes. And the border. Yeah, that's a little something you're going to have to read to learn about. Oh, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those forever like questions that carries through. It's one of those threads that carries through the books, the series. And then here, this was the latest edition, which is, if you look at the badge on top, it says the obligatory sex pot edition. <laughs> now, the reason we did this is because I was, again, I'm, I'm a research guy. So I was with my wife and we we're doing research. And I'm like, okay, how do we make this book popular? And you can't deny if you go on Kickstarter and you sort by successful projects, the most funded projects on average are you know, like half naked women, soft core, they're pr practically soft core porn. Mm -hmm. And I think I've mentioned this before. They're not always that soft. And so there's all these like sexy women on the covers and the pages and so-called living isn't like that at all. There's nothing sexy about so-called living. It's a great book, but there's nothing sexy about it. And I kind of wanted to kind of play along with that uh, trope of like, if you want to be successful on Kickstarter, you got to have a sexy cover, right? And it goes along with the tongue in cheek humor of, 
the book itself. So we made a badge called the obligatory sex pot edition, as in it's something you need to have if you want to be successful on Kickstarter, you know, kind of like, a, kind of like a little, a little gag because I have nothing against sexy covers. I like sexy covers just as much as the next guy. I have I un- sex sells and I understand. I have nothing against it. I am a man that takes offense to nothing. <laughs> so, so we took two of our characters from in the book. That's Jill on the cover of book one. That's just uh, one of the waitress characters in book two. Now, these girls do not look like this in the book. The This is the equivalent of like when you go to Comic-Con, and I've used this example before, when you see somebody sexy cosplay as SpongeBob. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. So that's the idea. It's like we made a sexy Jill and we made a sexy person in the waitress, but they don't look like that in the book. But if you are the kind of person that likes sexy covers, we got you covered. But if you don't like sexy covers, this goes back to my statement. Don't spread the hate. You don't have to hate it. Just get one of the irregular covers. We have guest artists. We have Mark Leone's art. Like we have a lot of just, we have something for everyone. And if you want them all, if you keep scrolling, you'll see there's an all in package. So like for collectors who want everything, we got all the covers and you see bunnies continued <laughs> that you can get all the covers here and with, with the digital editions all included in one nice little package. And then as far as add-ons, we kept it simple. We only did two. So there's only five tiers. One of them is the all in. And then for add-ons we have for $5, I'll sign all the books in your tier. And for $8, you can get this cool, as you see right there, actually I have one. I'll show you when, when, when I'm back on camera, it's a blood bunny keychain that we make ourselves. We make those and they're acrylic. It's white and black acrylic. The deal with that is for $8, you're not only just getting a keychain, which again, handmade, <laughs> you're also automatically entered into a list of official members of the blood bunny colony. And that will get you discounts on all future so-called living Kickstarters. Now, I don't know what those discounts are, but I want to award people who gave that little extra to support our project. Right. Cause we're just, I'm just a guy. I'm not a, a corporation. I'm not trying to, I'm just trying to fund my, fund my dream. Right. That's what Kickstarter is about. So that's uh that's the other add on you can get is the, the keychain. Where's the bunny? There's oh. the keychain right there. So he's, he's going to have a metal chain yep. there. We have the metal chains. I just didn't attach it. And that's the, that's a first concept. It does. The back does not exist yet. This is scrap <laughs> that we, this is a piece of scrap acrylic that we had. It had one clean side, and one dirty side from another project that uh, my wife was working on. So it's on the back, cool, yeah, it is. It's it's a, it's really cool. Like I said, it's acrylic. It's white acrylic, and then we have a laser cutter. And when it cuts into it, the black gets exposed. So and on the back, it's going to have the so-called living logo, and it'll say "official member of the Blood Bunny Colony." You could have rare collectibles of the keychains if you get like some of those random prototypes that you had, and then it'll just have like something different on the back of it. Yeah, chances are it's going to be Christmas related because my wife makes a lot of Christmas ornaments. Like, actually, you can't make it out, but that's part of a mitten. No, it looks like a great campaign. You have some wonderful products there. The fact that it's Canadian pricing in an American-dominated market when it comes to comics, I think, is a great cost-effective alternative if you want to support an amazing new comic that's out there. So I can't wait to see this go on to issues eight, which means you'll have to come back on for every single time you have a campaign. I'd, I'd love to. And I don't know if you noticed the Kickstarter page. One last note I want to say is when I designed it, because I've never designed a Kickstarter page before, I based it on what I found enticing and what made it easier for me. So I kept not a lot of tiers, four different tiers and want all in. So like five tiers total. I don't have a bunch of add-ons. I just have the two. I took that from how board game Kickstarters are. They're a lot easier to follow. A lot of graphics, a lot of simple information. It's bold letters, kind of like in your face. I noticed a lot of comic book kickstarters they're successful so there's like people that are more used to that format than me but like they had like 18 tiers 22 tiers but if you look at the tiers it's like two backers zero backers four backers and then you'll have like only three tiers that are like 50 backers 80 backers so you have all these tiers but not everybody's backing all those tiers maybe they come later on as add-ons behind the scene i don't know but there have been a lot of successful kickstarters with like a crazy amount of tiers but I find it myself a little intimidating, right? To go in there and be like, holy crap, I don't know what to get. So yeah. I try to make a page that I felt comfortable with, that I would feel comfortable backing. And I just try to make it not confusing for people, yeah. right? But that goes to show research and that goes to show that simpler is better. Keep it simple, stupid. The KISS method works well in any industry. <laughs> and I tell myself that often. Yeah. Sometimes they're like, Okay, I should add more, should I add more? Nope, just keep it simple. I'll definitely be picking up the series for me. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. 
Who was that for you? Do I have to pick one? Because I have three. Todd McFarlane, because I, I am an artist, not a very good sequential artist. Love Todd McFarlane's stuff. He's what really got me into comics. Spider-Man Torment is what pulled me in. That's the, my first comic book as a collector. Brian Michael Bendis, as a writer, he's the one that taught me. I wasn't a huge Avengers fan, I'll admit. But when he started writing Avengers, I liked it. I was like, as long as you're a good writer, you can make these pompous superheroes that I was not into, into like these really interesting, they seem like people, they can make sarcastic remarks. Like, like he just did a great job at writing. Like, I love all this stuff. I love his wit. I love the way his dialogue flows. He inspires me. Robert Kirkman. I was reading Walking Dead before it was a TV show. I read all his uh, super dinosaur stuff. <laughs> Invincible, I didn't finish reading everything and I haven't watched anything from the show because I want to finish reading the series. Amazing writing. Writing. So Kirkman and Bendis for writers are like the top of my list. Like, I hope my books can get into their hands, like all three of them. I'd like for them to read it and be like, wow, that was, that was funny. That was good. I enjoyed that because that's what they did for me. And I'd like to do it back. I'd like to reciprocate. From a professional standpoint, you are a successful video game creator, a podcaster slash YouTube channel creator, a comic creator with so-called living. Professionally, you're successful on many fronts. Do you consider yourself personally successful? If this goes back to a conversation we had about being hard on myself. I think I'm successful at points. If people like so-called living, they enjoy it. Then I'd say I'm successful in that aspect. But overall, I'm too hard on myself to say that I'm just successful in general. I have board game coffee videos that some people love. And I'm like, I'm successful at that project. Other ones that are like, either people aren't watching it. They don't like it. I was like, well, I failed at that. I don't look at myself as a success, but I have been successful. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? I am hard on myself, but I don't hate my failures. I learn more from my failures than I do my successes. Here's the thing. I've said before, I was like, I don't mind failing. That's when I was working for somebody else. It wasn't my project. And there's been failures and there's successes. And there were things from the failures that we took and we made successes. If I made something and somebody's like, I hate it. I'm like, that's okay. That's okay. We'll move forward. We'll learn from this and we'll do better. But when it's mine, if somebody tells me like, I hate it, it's going to hurt. I'll try to do better, but it's going to hurt. I can't just brush it off like I would if it's me working for somebody else. If I'm working for you, I do something that somebody hates, I'm going to try to make it better. Obviously, I'm trying to make it good to begin with. I am going to take so-called living criticism more personally. I know it's going to happen. I will look at any failures, though, as stepping stone to success. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's in video games or YouTube or now with a comic, you know, maybe you're inspiring them down their path. And the fact that you have the younger generation with you, maybe you're going to inspire them down a creative path as well. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Yeah, that's a good question. Good question. I'd say <sighs> inspire people by teaching them that you can produce good work and be a good person at the same time and help other people. So I try to help artists get into the video industry. I've done portfolio reviews. I would give them tips. I'm more than happy to help anybody do anything, give them advice when I can. And if I can help somebody younger do that, I hope that when they get older, they can pass that on and they can pass on that information and help other people be successful. That's what I'd want the younger generation to do is just pay it forward if your life was a video game or a comic book what would its title be and what would its soundtrack be funny ask that <laughs> so-called living is actually the title i gave my life when i did this like it, I, that's just what i thought of like the title actually came to me first and then i was like so-called living and then I, it, the whole thing came about like what is so-called living i was like people use that term in like I got a shitty job. I'm doing this. I guess this is my so-called living. But at the same time, it's like, what if it was a little more literal and like, you're a vampire, so you're dead. So you're not really living. So it's like, you're so-called living. It's got that double meaning to it. Right. And that's what Jack is like. So so-called living is the title I gave my life. And I just put it on my comic book. And as far as the soundtrack, that's a little, a little harder because funny enough, this is another question that I actually have thought of because creating, but not in the way you put it but I have thought of it because I need music. When I do my videos, I'll put music that matches me. It matches my personality, matches my speech pattern. And if you look at any of our, cause I have a bunch of different videos, but we have these espresso videos, like with an X, not espresso, like espresso. It's kind of a play on words because we're, you know, board game coffee and it's a quick video. So we made it espresso. If you watch any of those espresso videos while I'm talking, like there's an intro song, it's not that song. And this is very 
poppy, happy background beat that I just got from like pay license and you get this music. So I pay for it. That is the soundtrack to my life. It's got the right pace. So it's not like a popular song that's out there, but that song is the soundtrack. That's what runs in my head as I <laughs> go through. Maybe you can play it now. If you just, you can probably just, I can, I can send you the song. You can play it at this point. You know, Mike, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of two geeks talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. It's, it's amazing. And anytime, as soon as you messaged me, I was like, well, that's, that's great. Like you're awesome for, for doing this for me. Cause I'm, I'm nobody. You just had like the, like I said, I watched the video of like the artist from Green Lantern. And I was like, I, I haven't drawn Green Lantern. <laughs> right? I'm like nobody. So I appreciate you taking the time to, to have me on, like in giving, you know, the little guys a chance, but I really appreciate that. Like more than I can put into words. So thank you very much. Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? Of course, where is this amazing campaign and anything else you would like to promote? As far as the comic book goes, you can go to Kickstarter and just search so-called living, but you have to have that space or a dash. So dash called or so space called living. So it's the way it's written on the screen. Actually, it'll has big projects. We love badge so-calledliving.com that website's under construction so the kickstarter is really the most important page at the moment and as far as board game coffee goes on youtube just do a search for board game coffee we're board game coffee everywhere so board game coffee on instagram youtube facebook instagram and youtube are biggest channels hop in there subscribe it'd be much appreciated well like i said that ends this particular episode of two geeks talk you can of course find this interview and 1200 plus others find them at tgtmedia.com or two geeks talking.com that's t-w-o website is going through a complete rebuild you could find all of these interviews on our youtube channel youtube.com forward slash tgt media the podcast is back and find that at two geeks talking.popping.com or just search two geeks talking wherever you get your podcasts and as i say every week everyone has a story to tell it's up to me to help bring that out thanks for listening watching on two geeks talking